Yeah, please come forward. You are, you guys are going to grill me, okay? Come forward. Don't get scared. Laser pointer to us. Yeah, I, I can Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so we are commemorating the 75th years of our independence. And as part of that, we are organizing the seminar series uh, by distinguished speakers, uh, which is on genomics and health. Uh, as part of that, this is the first seminar that has been uh, today. This talk will be given by uh, Dr. Shudipta Roy. Uh, it's my great pleasure 
to introduce Dr. Roy. Uh, he is no stranger to NIBMG. Actually, he used to be an NIBMG member. He spent a six months sabbatical from 2017, uh, July to December in NIBMG. Uh, Shudip Toda uh, completed his schooling from Gothels High School, uh, Karshiang and La Martinier Boys. And then he did, uh, uh, then he moved to, uh, for BSc he did from Presidency College, Calcutta, and in Zoology Honors. And he stood first class first, and then moved to Jawahar, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. MSc, he also secured first class first, and then uh, he joined Dr. Vijay Raghavan in uh, National Center for Biological Sciences in TIFR uh, for his PhD, uh, where he worked on Hox gene clusters uh, on uh, in flies, uh, on muscle development, and then uh, he moved to University of Sheffield, and there he got introduced to zebrafish, and uh, uh, he worked on uh, slow muscle tweaking on uh, in, in zebrafish in, in University of Sheffield with Philip Ingham. Uh, Shudip Toda started his uh, independent research career uh, in 2003 in IMCB Singapore, Institute of Molecular and Cell Biology, where he is currently working. And uh, he's, he has published many papers and stellar publication records and many nature cell science journals and uh, uh, also, he got covers on these, and I don't want to bore you with all these facts. He works on his primary research interests is currently on cilia, uh, role of cilia in here and uh, involvement of cilia in human diseases. And here is uh, Dr. Shudip Roy uh, for his presentation. Thank you, Molina, for the generous introduction, and thank you all of you for. Uh, coming for listening to this talk this afternoon. And I had a, a sumptuous lunch of uh, Shorshe, Parshe, and you know, uh, Mishti Doi and Papur. So thank you very much again for hosting this lunch. It was absolutely, and I hope I'm not going to fall asleep, okay? So throw something at me if I'm falling asleep. Okay, so what we're going to do today is uh, look at cilia, and I'm going to talk about two human disorders um, that, could be impacted by cilia. Okay, so that's the purpose of this uh, symposium. I believe that uh, looking at how um, genomics and animal models are helping to understand human disorders. So um, first, I would just like to, uh, as Molinat said, I've been working at the IMCB for several years now, almost 20 years, and uh, I'm also adjunct with the National University of Singapore at the uh, Department of Biological Sciences as well as the uh, pediatrics uh, department. So uh, cilia are um, organelles which have been discovered many, many years ago by, uh, the credit actually goes to this Dutch microscope is called uh, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, who discovered these organelles way back in the 17th century. He was a businessman, but he was also an amateur microscopist, and he observed cilia in different uh, microorganisms, and that's how uh, we came to know that cilia exist. Um, they are, um, you know, easily visible in um, invertebrate organisms, for example, algae like Chlamydomonas, paramecium, the larval forms of different uh, invertebrates like mollusks and annelids. And uh, the most important thing is why we are interested in cilia is because they are abundant in our own bodies, as we shall see. So people have been captivated by cilia because they are beautiful in the sense that they, they are able to move, okay? So um, the ciliary bands on these larval forms of invertebrates allow them to swim around in free, uh, freely in water. So if you observe these organisms under the microscope, you can watch these cilia moving in a very rhythmic pattern. So this is a quote from uh, the Scottish uh, biologist William Sharpie, and he said that if you look at ciliary motion in the animal kingdom, they are pretty widespread. And if you are keen enough and you want to pursue this as a career, you'll be rewarded with much interesting discoveries. So um, broadly, cilia can be classified into two kinds. Um, the more conventional one is the motile cilia, which I alluded to in the first slide. And these are present in our bodies in specific organs. For example, the respiratory system is filled with these motile cilia. And actually these um, organelles have become pretty prominent and celebrated because of the COVID uh, pandemic. 
because the first line of defense for respiratory pathogens are cilia. They are beating continuously in your respiratory tract while you're sitting and listening to me, and uh, they're clearing out all the inhaled uh, particles and pathogens uh, along with the mucus. They are also present in the brain ventricles and in the spinal canal, and uh, they are functioning there to circulate cerebrospinal fluid. As you know, cerebrospinal fluid is a nourishing fluid that is present in the cavities of the central nervous system, and the, the, the fluid is circulated by the beating of the cilia. Whereas the primary cilia, they are immotile, so they have lost the ability to move, and they are present on almost all cells in the body, except for perhaps some immune cells, and they are more dedicated for signaling purposes. So um, they function in vision, they function in olfaction, they function in uh, hearing. So the fact that you are seeing what you're seeing is because there are cilia in your photoreceptors, which are transporting photopigments, uh, and the photopigments get bleached all the time. So you need an active transport mechanism for ensuring that fresh pigments are there in the retinal cells, and that's because there is a ciliary transport mechanism in the retina. Similarly, when I was eating shorshe parshe, this was beautiful smell, and the smell was because I was receiving the signal from olfactory receptors, which are concentrated on the cilia in my nose. Okay, so one common feature of uh, COVID is actually anosmia, where people lose the sense of smell, and you can imagine because the virus actually can infect these ciliated cells and destroy them. So you have both respiratory problems as well as uh, smell problems. So here's an electron micrograph of a cilium. They're pretty small structures, and they're best studied by microscopy. So electron microscopy is, of course, very important. And uh, what you can see is uh, the basic structure of this organelle. So it consists of something called the basal body, which is nothing but a refurbished centriole. So centrioles are components of the centrosome, which participate in cell division. But when a cell doesn't divide, the centrioles are decorated with special proteins called centriolar appendages, and that allow them to dock onto the apical membrane and serve as a platform for ciliogenesis. So then the cilium grows out as a, through a process called intraflagellar transport, and uh, the ciliary membrane is, an, it is basically an extension of the plasma membrane. But the plasma membrane and the ciliary membrane are quite distinct in the sense that there is a gating mechanism at the base of the cilium called the transition zone, which prevents proteins which are normally localized on the plasma membrane from getting access to the ciliary membrane and vice versa. Okay? So that's basically what a cilium looks like in, um, in simplicity. And uh, the reason why we're also very excited about cilia is because uh, ciliary uh, dysfunction causes a lot of human diseases. So there was a huge collection of uh, human genetic disorders that were um, cataloged by human geneticists for many years. And now we know that these disorders arise because of dysfunction in cilia. And many of the patients actually exhibit very pleiotropic phenotypes. For example, it, you have phenotypes in the brain, you have phenotypes in over craniofacial development in the limbs, and a common feature of many of the ciliopathies is the development of polycystic kidneys. Okay? So um, this is not very surprising given that cilia are present in every cell. So if you have mutations in genes causing ciliary disorders, then you would imagine that the phenotype should be manifest in many, many places. Okay? So um, we entered into cilia research rather serendipitously, as Molinath mentioned. I started looking at um, uh, hedgehog signaling in the zebrafish many years ago with Phil Ingham in, in the UK, and what we were, so Phil is credited with discovery of the hedgehog pathway, so I think you guys must have come across this pathway in your transcriptomic analysis or even in cancers and other, other, other uh, biological aspects of um, uh, disease or development. And uh, so his lab was uh, the, the lab which cloned Smoothen, which is the receptor for hedgehog, and also Patched, which is also a co-receptor for hedgehog. So um, uh, when we studied uh, with Phil, we didn't know that cilia were required for hedgehog signals. So we were looking at uh, zebrafish embryos, which were mutant, and uh, how they were responding to different um, levels of hedgehog signaling. And uh, we studied this gene called iguana. And then we also looked at um, another protein called postal 2 which is a kinesin-like protein, not knowing that this protein actually localizes to cilia at that time. And more lately, we looked at uh, FOXJ1, which is an important transcription factor for uh, ciliary development. Okay, so um, these were uh, rather serendipitous. Uh, we did not deliberately look at these kinds of things, and then we realized that all of these have a common uh, substrate, which is really which is cilia. So today we'll focus on two aspects of ciliary function. One is idiopathic scoliosis, and the other is of course fertility. So idiopathic scoliosis is uh, a very common disorder. So apparently 
there are about three to four percent of adolescents uh, worldwide which who are affected by uh, scoliosis. And as the name suggests, idiopathic means uh, not known, uh, not of a known cause. So you, it's difficult to say why these patients have scoliosis. So scoliosis stands for this um, um, abnormal um, you know, uh, curvature of the spine. And apparently, um, Hippocrates, who is supposed to be the father of uh, medicine, he was the first person to have described scoliosis. And I think the term scoliosis was coined by him. So this is an old disease. So people have noted people with abnormal spines for a long time. And the, the, the confounding problem is that um, there is no malformation of the vertebrae that could explain this. So if you do an MRI or X-ray, you don't see any malformations in the skeleton of the, of the, of the, or of the individual, but they develop these profound curvatures which causes compression of the chest cavity, leading to breathing difficulties, gait, posture, and of course, severe back pain. So the current treatment options are typically for severe cases, surgery, where you implant steel braces to keep the spine straight, or you also have uh, elaborate physiotherapy regimes, for example, traction and other things to you know, maintain a straight spine. So it's an ongoing problem. And actually the problem with surgery is that sometimes after surgery, the outcome is even worse than the disease itself. Okay, so this causes a lot of uh, agony among the patients. So we knew in zebrafish that many cilia gene mutants cause an abnormal axis. So the wild type zebrafish embryo, so this is an embryo at about four days or two days fertilization, 48 hours. And what you can see is that the embryo has a straight axis, like we also have a straight axis. And then, um, but mutants in many cilia genes have this abnormality where the axis is curved. So um, in fact, when the large scale mutagenesis screens were done in the zebrafish, this was the largest collection of mutants that were discovered in zebrafish, but people didn't know what, why they have these uh, abnormal spines, okay? So um, in, in 2016, there was this beautiful paper from uh, Rebecca, Rebecca Burdine and uh, Brian Siruna's group, where they utilized the power of zebrafish genetics. So imagine that you can have a allele of a gene which is temperature sensitive, okay? So when you grow these animals, at a restrictive temperature, which is 30 degrees, the protein becomes dysfunctional. Okay, so it's a point mutation in the protein called C12, C21 or 59, which is a protein required for assembly of the motility apparatus in cilia. But because of the single amino acid change, when you grow these animals at 30 degrees, the protein is dysfunctional and you get the phenotype. So the embryo is curved up. Whereas if you grow these animals at 25 degrees, which is the permissive temperature, the protein is able to fold properly, is functional, and you don't get the phenotype. So it's a very beautiful tool to analyze the temporal requirement of a gene for a particular process, okay? So then you can imagine what they did. They grew the animals at 25 degrees first. So when you grow them at 25 degrees, then you get a straight embryonic axis so they don't die because these embryos who are curved down, obviously they will die because they won't be able to swim, right? You can't expect a fish which is having a curved body like this to swim around freely. So they used this clever trick where they grew these embryos at 25 and overcame the embryonic lethality and then they switched them back to 30 degrees. And when they did that, these fish developed into adults with very severe spine curvatures, okay? So, and this spine curvature at the level of this CT scan is almost the same as the human scoliotic spine. So you get no abnormalities in the vertebrae, but the spine shows this profound curvature, okay? So they proposed that um, these fish would be a good model for uh, studying idiopathic scoliosis. Now, remember that the models that we normally rely on for biomedical research is the mouse. But the mouse has a difference between humans. So we are bipedal. We stand straight and our spine is on the uh, is at the mercy of gravity to keep it straight. Right. So the gravity is always pulling us down. But the mouse does not have that problem because the mouse is quadrupedal. So to mimic a scoliotic uh, phenotype in the mouse with uh, human disease is not very easy. Some people have done some uh, gruesome experiments where they've amputated the limbs of the mice pups when they were born to mimic uh, bipedalism situation, and they do develop um, scoliosis, but it's not a really good way to model um, uh, this, uh, this disorder. So the zebrafish is nice because you can imagine that the fish, when it swims through viscous water, it, the spine is under a similar compressive force, like our spine is uh, for gravity. Okay, So our, the, our spine is being pulled down by gravity, whereas the fish 
spine is being compressed by the viscous water through which it is swimming. So it makes it a very comparable system to study these processes. So um, uh, the cilia uh, that are there in the brain and spinal canal um, are supposed to be required for the spine curvature because this gene C21 or 59 is a gene that is required for, as I said, assembly of the motility apparatus of the cilia. So when you grow these animals at a restrictive temperature, then the cilia become completely immortal, and that gives rise to this curved body axis. Okay, and uh, by projection, then when you grow these animals first at the permissive temperature and then shift them at 30 degrees, you get this phenotype because of the abnormalities in cilia. So this is the first link that we had between cilia dysfunction and problems with the vertebral column. So how are cilia uh, involved in this? So if you look at um, this very nice video from my colleague uh, Alice May May Mayonier, so she looked at the brain ventricles of the mouse and you can see that uh, the ventricles have got lots of cilia in them. So this is the cell membrane of the ventricular ependymal cells and you have these cilia projecting from the surface. And if you can look at this video, you can see that the cilia are beating coordinately and they actually provide vectorial flow of fluid. So in this case, this is artificial flow in the culture, but in the in the animal, it is the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid. So um, we published a paper uh, a few years ago, and actually this paper was written when I was in, a in IBMG in 2017. So it's quite historic that I'm giving this talk. Yeah, I didn't talk about this work that time because it was uh, being sent out for review. So it was a collaboration with my uh, colleague Cheng Tian in, uh, in, in China. So a, this has a very interesting history because I, I was in China uh, at uh, Shuzhou for the Cold Spring Harbor Centrosome and Cilia meeting. And having arrived from Singapore a few hours earlier than the prescribed time for registration, I was just sitting in the hotel room looking through the abstract book. And I found that there was this abstract from Cheng Tian's group talking about some work that they were doing, which seemed to be very similar to what we had done. So then I met Cheng Tian at the dinner table and then we discussed and we decided that we should collaborate and that's the product of um, uh, this collaboration. So what we show here is that uh, the cilia in the brain and the spinal canal, they drive flow of cerebrospinal fluid and this fluid carries important hormones like epinephrine, which is also called adrenaline. Adrenaline then activates certain neuropeptides in the neurons which are lining the spinal canal called the cerebrospinal fluid contacting neurons. And these neurons, then they secrete these proteins called urotensins, which then signal to the muscles of the back, causing them to change their tone and contraction to bring about proper axial straightening, okay? So that's what I'm gonna discuss in the first part of the talk. So uh, how do we know that cerebrospinal fluid flow is affected in ciliary mutants? What you can do is you can, this is a wild type embryo, and these are different ciliary mutants having different degrees of body curvature. Okay? So we can inject uh, fluorescent dyes into the brain of the zebrafish embryo and then watch how the dye moves in the brain and the spinal cord. So in the wild type, as soon as you inject the dye, the dye front keeps moving very fast down the spine. Okay? So you can see the after five minutes it's moved so far, 10 minutes and 20 minutes is run down the axis of the embryo. On the other hand, if you inject into the ciliary mutants, for example, Zemin 10, Oval, or GIF3B, then you can see that the movement is much more restricted. So they, either they move uh, quite far, uh, uh, almost similar to the wild tap, or they are not able to move at all. And what we correlated was that the movement of the dye front was directly um, uh, correlated with the movement of the cilia. So in GIF3B mutants, uh, there is some amount of ciliary movement still there in these mutants, so that's why the diaphragm is able to move some amount, whereas in the Zemin 10 and oval mutants, the cilia are completely immotile and the dye doesn't move very far at all. Okay? So this suggests two things. One is that ciliary movement is required for driving cerebrospinal fluid in the brain, and ciliary movement capacity correlates with the degree of curvature of the body axis. So in Zemin 10, for example, where there is almost no ciliary activity and no CSF flow, the curvature is much stronger, whereas in GIF3B mutants, where the flow is still there and there is some amount of ciliary activity, the curvature is not as strong. Okay, is that understandable so far? If there are any questions, don't hesitate to raise your hand and ask me. Okay. So having established that, 
we wanted to see what is acting downstream of this flow that is causing this problem. So we know that CSF is a very nutritive fluid. It contains a lot of ions, for example, magnesium, sodium, potassium. It contains a lot of uh, growth factors, for example, insulin-like growth factor, retinoic acid, and lots of other stuff. Uh, but how do these uh, molecules or, act or components cause this problem of body curvature were not very clear. So what we decided to do is we took these embryos and did an RNA-seq analysis to see what are the genes that are misregulated because of the absence of CD reactivity that could give rise to this abnormal body axis. And we found that two genes encoding this urotensin-related peptide 1s, 1 and 2, were strikingly down-regulated in these mutants. And the beauty of the zebrafish, which unfortunately is not very much possible if you do cell culture work is that you can actually go and take a look at where these genes are expressed, spatial. And uh, lo and behold, these genes are expressed along the spine. Uh, so this is the wild type, and this is the anterior end, this is the dorsal end, and you're looking at the spine here. So these are neurons which are lit up by the probe for URP1, and these neurons are special neurons called the cerebrospinal fluid contacting neurons. Okay. And similarly, we found URP2 also labels the same population of neurons called the cerebrospinal fluid. So this dashed line gives you the region where the notochord forms, which will ultimately transform into the vertebral column. Okay. Now, if you look at the expression in the mutants, the expression is strongly downregulated, consistent with the transcriptomic data. On the other hand, uh, we know that these neurons are still there because you could argue that maybe the expression is gone because neurons are not developing properly. Uh, but to rule out that, we looked at this protein called PKD2 like 1. So this encodes a channel like protein, and we found that the expression of PKD2 like 1 is unaffected in these mutants. Okay? So this suggests that these neurons, are, the cerebrospinal con uh, contact neurons, are there in these embryos, but um, they are unable to express URP1 and URP2. So we also looked at uh, situations where URP1 and URP2 were uh, down-regulated, either using morpholinos or mutants. And we found that when you inactivate these proteins, you can uh, get curved body axis. And more uh, impressively, if you inject the URP1 RNA or URP2 RNA in these ciliary mutants, you can rescue them and get back straight body axis. So this suggests that the defect in the curvature of these embryos is because of the inactivity of the URP1 and URP2 genes. So what are these URP1 and URP2 genes? So these are small neuropeptides. The genes are pretty small. Most of the vertebrates have just a single exon because the proteins are about 20 or so amino acids. But the really active moieties at the C-terminal of uh, six amino acids, uh, which is very, very conserved across all vertebrates and among all the URP proteins that are there in each species. Okay, And it is a cyclic peptide, so it undergoes, it, it is made as a pre-pro-hormone kind of protein that undergoes processing through furin-like convertases, and uh, you get secretion of this uh, hexapeptide active moiety that is then signaling. So uh, we decided to look at um, what in the CSF is turning on the expression of these genes in the spinal cord. Because I showed you that these embryos have uh, lack cilia motility, so they're unable to circulate cerebrospinal fluid, and uh, consequently, they have loss of expression of URP1 and URP2. But what is it that is there in CSF? Is it just the mechanical force of the CSF? So for that, what we did is we um, drained, we manually, you can manually drain the CSF by injecting uh, by puncturing the brain with a syringe and drawing out the normal CSF from the brain. So in that situation, what happens is that the embryo develops a curved body axis, okay? And we also replaced that CSF with artificial CSF, which is have, lacking all the growth factors, but having most of the other ionic composition of CSF. And we could rule out that it's not just the mechanical force of uh, CSF flow that is causing this, because if you replace the, the endogenous CSF with artificial CSF, you cannot rescue the body curvature. We also looked at some components, for example, retinoic acid, and we also looked at um, uh, IGF-like uh, proteins, and none of them could rescue the phenotype. So what my collaborator decided to do is he decided to do a drug screen. So he used a set of compounds which was available from Target Molecule Corporation, which were mostly targeting G-proteins or G-protein couple receptors. Okay? And what we found is this compound called dipivephrine uh, could efficiently rescue the body curvature. And dipivephrine actually is a uh, analog of epinephrine, so it's a prodrug. So in the body, it's uh, processed uh, to produce epinephrine. 
And this is the pathway for epinephrine or adrenaline production in the body. So other molecules, for example, topa and uh, L-dopa and dopamine are precursors of uh, epinephrine. So we found that not just dipepinephrine, but also epinephrine when administered in the fish water in which you are culturing these embryos could rescue the body access abnormality. So these are uh, controls where you treated it with the carrier, DMSO, whereas in uh, uh, the mutants treated with epinephrine dissolved in DMSO, you can rescue back the body curvature. And we could show that this curvature restoration is because there's a restoration of uh, URP expression. Okay, so this is the mutant. Normally, it does not have URP expression, whereas with epinephrine pre treatment, you can get back URP expression. Okay, so all this made sense. So it suggests that the CSF contains epinephrine, and epinephrine triggers the expression of um, uh, the expression of these URP genes in the cerebrospinal contacting neurons, and these proteins somehow signal to bring about proper body access uh, uh, development. So uh, what, how, is, how are these, uh, these proteins then signaling? Because these are small peptides and from literature from the mammals suggested that they uh, signal through G-protein couple receptors. So we screen for uh, their receptors in the zebrafish and uh, there are, in mammals there's just the one receptor, whereas in, in the fish there are four or five of them. And we screened for expression in early embryogenesis at the time when this body curvature abnormality is seen. And we found that one of them called UTS2RA, standing for urotensin receptor 2A or whatever, um, is expressed in the embryo. So uh, the in situ hybridization was very difficult to get done because the, pro the gene is expressed at very low level. Okay? So instead, we resorted to back engineering. So we uh, isolated a back and then we knocked in a GFP into the uh, locus so that the promoter would be driving the GFP in a pattern that is consistent with the endogenous pattern. And when we injected the back into the fish, you can see that it labels all the muscle cells. And a closer resolution of this expression suggested that it's expressed in two interesting patterns. Firstly, it is expressed in only one kind of muscles, which are these red colored muscles stained with an antibody against myosin that labels these muscles. And um, it is also present in the dorsal half. So how many people here eat fish? I think most of us eat fish here, right? So you've eaten fish which look like this a cut like that, a lateral cut, or a, a, this is called a steak cut, right? So this is the steak where you cut the fish uh, from the dorsal ventral side. The Elish March, I'm sure you've all been eating Elish March this season. And, you know, when you eat the Elish March, if you have not been mindful, take a look at this outer layer of muscles, which is a very deep red color, okay? It's much more tastier. It's more oily. It's, it's red because it's more oxidative, okay? So that is the layer of muscles we are talking about. So that's called the slow fibers. So they are able to metabolize oxidatively and they are able to contract for a long time and allow the fish. So when the fish is happy swimming around, you know, looking for food casually, it's typically using its slow muscles. But the moment they see a predator or some other major signal, they will activate something called the fast muscles, which are the major bulk of the myotome. Okay, that's the major meat of the fish. And they are able to metabolize anaerobically. They contract really rapidly and allow the fish to escape very fast. Okay? So we found that the receptor is expressed exclusively in slow fibers. And when we mutated that receptor, we found that uh, the adult fish developed scoliosis. Okay? So from this study, we have a model where we propose that there are motile cilia in the brain and the spinal canal. They drive CSF flow. The CSF contains hormones such as epinephrine, which are broadly called catecholamines, and they activate the expression of these URP1, URP2 genes in the cerebrospinal contacting neurons. They signal to this through this G-protein couple receptor called urotensin receptor, which is expressed on muscle cells and possibly induce contractions of muscle, which bring about proper straightening of the axis of the animal. Okay, so that was the idea. So while this paper was uh, uh, in press. There was a very interesting work published from a colleague of mine called uh, Claire Wyatt and his on her postdoc Claire Look. And what they did is they studied a, a, a molecule called scospondin, uh, which is supposed to be a constituent of a fiber called the Reissner fiber. I'm 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 pretty sure none of you have heard about the Reissner fiber. Okay, I never knew about it, uh, but you might have uh, been acquainted with a structure called the Reissner membrane. 
So the Reichstag membrane is a membrane that's there in our cochlea, which it, it divides the cochlea into two parts, allowing it to uh, for proper um, compartmentalization of the semicircular canals and the cochlea. So, um, but and it's credited to the same person who discovered them. So the Reichstag fiber is a glycoprotein fiber. It, it is made up of a protein called spospondin. And the, uh, in, the, in, in humans, scospondin protein is coding for a protein which is about 5,000 something amino acids long. So it's a huge protein, okay? One of the biggest proteins in animals. So you can see in uh, a normal zebrafish embryo, the fiber runs all along the spine, okay? This is labeled with a scospondin antibody, and it is present all along the spinal canal. In the scospondin mutants, which they made, the fiber is absent, okay? And they develop uh, curved body, just like mutants that I showed you, which lack cilia activity. Okay, so they showed that in the cilia mutants, the fiber is unable to form properly because cilia activity is required for polymerizing this fiber into this uh, the, this glycoprotein into this fiber, and without the polymerization, uh, these uh, mutants develop curved body axis. So they said that the fiber is credited. Uh, the discovery is credited to Ernst Reisner. And uh, these are some early electron micrograph images of the fiber from animals such as the cat and the rabbit. Uh, you can see the fiber here in high resolution. But the most important thing is to note here is that it is typically associated with cilia. So these are the ciliated cells with bundles of cilia sticking out in the spinal canal. And here is the fiber. So close association of cilia and the fiber. And there are a lot of very interesting stories about the fiber because it's been enigmatic. It is so large, nobody had a mutant for it. So the zebrafish mutant was the first gene mutant for scospondin. And there's some very interesting uh, spiritual uh, attributes, uh, spiritual, uh, spirituality attributed to the fiber. Apparently that the fiber allows you to realize uh, God or whatever you call it, you know. So uh, you're welcome to explore that. Now, we, we, we were quite struck by Claire's finding and we saw that uh, if the scospondin mutants also develop curved body like the cilia mutants, there must be some close, there must be some um, connection between this, this two. So we started looking, so we requested those uh, mice, uh, sorry, those fish from Claire and we looked at it. So what we found is that the Reissner fiber is actually required for activating urotensin signaling in the cerebrospinal fluid contacting neurons. And this comes from early biochemical studies with the Reissner fiber isolated from cows. So of course, cows is a good choice because cows are sort of slaughtered all over the world and you can actually isolate the fiber very easily from the cow brain and the spinal cord. And people have done a lot of uh, biochemical studies with the fiber. And they have shown that the Reissner fiber is like a sponge which is able to bind a lot of epinephrine. So all this makes sense. So then cerebrospinal fluid containing a lot of epinephrine transported by cilia and then the epinephrine binds to the Reissner fiber. The Reissner fiber are in close contact with the CSF contacting neurons and cilia, and they present this concentrated epinephrine to the cerebral spinal fluid contacting neurons, and that helps to turn on um, the uh, URP genes. Okay, so what we first did is we got those fish from Claire, and we looked at um, what would happen to these embryos. So these are the scospondin or the Reissner fiber mutant embryos. So just like the cilia mutants, you can see that they, level, they develop strong curved bodies, and these are the siblings. So just to tell you that the zebrafish develop inside an eggshell called the chorion, and I'm sure Molinat must have showed you some of these embryos in our, your facility in NIPMG. So what we did is we manually dechorinated these embryos. So we removed the chorion manually just to see whether um, the chorion was causing a more severe curvature of the body and whether we could get some of these embryos to actually survive into adulthood if their body curvature was not as strong. And this actually what happens. So when we decorate these embryos prematurely, they develop a slightly less body curvature. It's the confines of the chorion which actually cause the curvature to be more profound. And some of these animals, not all of them, but some, especially the ones which are less curved, they could develop into adults. And when they develop into adults, they again, lo and behold, show this very strong spine curvature. Again, the CT scan shows you that the phenotype is very similar to the cilia mutants that I showed you. And when we looked at the expression of the URP genes, again, in the wild type, you can see them expressing the CSFCNs. And in the mutants, they're either strongly reduced or almost completely absent. Okay? And then when we put back epinephrine, you can see that you can restore back the expression of these genes in the mutant embryos. So um, 
it was not just the restoration of the gene expression, but when we treated the racinal fiber mutant embryos with epinephrine, you could get back uh, straight body access. Okay? And we also decided to use a targeted approach to restore back uh, URP expression in these mutants using the promoter for the PKD2-like gene. So remember I told you that PKD2-like one is a channel protein that is expressed in the CSFCNs, but unlike the URP genes, that the expression of the PKD2-like gene is not affected in the mutants. Okay, So it's corresponding, the expression is almost same as wild type. So we use the promoter of the PKD2-like one gene to drive the expression of URP in these neurons, and we could recover adult fish, which are now looking perfectly normal. So the mutants, the homozygous mutants would look like this, and now we could rescue them by transgenically expressing URP2, and uh, they are genotypically mutant for scospondin, as you can see, it does, allele has a five base pair deletion, and this is a homozygous animal showing you the five base pair deletion, but it also has a transgene, which is, drive, uh, which is PKD2-like one promoter driving URP2, and the fish looks perfectly normal, okay? So we also tried to see what is the uh, sufficiency of um, URP signaling for body access development when you chronically expose these animals to URP signaling. So we made two constructs. One is a heat inducible construct, and the other is a construct driven by the myogenin promoting the muscles. So you can see if you inject these embryos with this heat shock transgene, without heat shock, they have no expression of URP2 and they remain pretty normal. As soon as you give a heat shock, within minutes, the body axis starts curving upwards. Okay, so it's an instantaneous effect of URP expression. Uh, but the heat shock promoter is an on-off switch. So when you give a heat shock, it turns on, and when you can bring it down to the permissive temperature, it shuts down. So the curvature again comes back to normalcy. Whereas if you use a chronic condition where you use myogenin promoter, which is a promoter which is continuously driving in the muscle cells, and you have this situation where the animal keeps on curving, and we've got animals where the curvature looks like almost like a shell, you know, like a snail's shell curving, uh, the axis curving uh, with a lot of spirals. So this suggests that uh, URP genes are not just required for a body axis straightening, but when you overexpress them, they can have the uh, opposite effect of causing a dorsal curvature of the body axis. And we also could mimic this effect by actually injecting the peptides, the active pep, the hex hexapeptides directly into the trunk of these embryos. And you can see that after injection, the axis starts curving upwards. Okay? So now we can revise this model that we proposed previously. So we have motor cilia in the brain and spinal canal. They drive the flow of cerebrospinal fluid, which contains catecholamines. The catecholamines bind to the Reissner fiber. Now the motor cilia are also required for aggregation of this large protein called phosphondin into the Reissner fiber. Okay? So there are two functions of the motor cilia. And the, this Reissner fiber bound catecholamines mines are presented to the cere cerebrospinal fluid contacting neurons. They upregulate the URP1, URP2 gene signal to the receptor in the muscle cells, and that brings about the action straightening. So this, this is the, really the latest uh, sort of uh, um, pathway that we have at the moment. Okay. Now we tested one more thing. We also tested the role of the muscles. So um, the muscles, uh, the slow muscles, they are induced by hedgehog signaling. So this was my postdoc work many, many years ago. So the muscles can be beautifully illustrated with these antibodies. For example, PROX1 labels these slow fibers very beautifully. It's a nuclear protein, so you can see all the nuclei very nicely. So if you take a mutation in the sonic hedgehog gene, I'm sure you guys must, have, must know about sonic hedgehogs. So it's a mutation in the zebrafish sonic hedgehog. You can see that the numbers of fibers are reduced compared to the wild type. And it's a reduction, not an elimination, because in uh, zebrafish and other vertebrates, there are multiple hedgehog genes, which are slightly compensatory. But if you look at smoothen, which is the only receptor for hedgehog, through which all the hedgehog signal, then you lose the muscles completely. So this suggests that hedgehog signaling is required for specifying these particular set of muscles. So then the idea is that if you inject the URP peptides in these mutants, you should not be able to get um, any response. So firstly, uh, the mutants have a curved body, which is not surprising because you lose the muscle cells. So if the muscle cells are important for body axis straightening, then you should expect them to be curved. And no matter what strategy you use, you use to express the URP proteins, either by using the margin in promoter or direct injection of the URP peptides, you cannot elicit any response in these mutants. Okay? So this suggests that these muscles are very important for the actual curvature. So is this at all relevant? Is this beautiful or interesting or 
you know, slightly esoteric work. Is the zebrafish at all relevant to human biology? So after a paper was published, there were a lot of papers which are coming out suggesting that mutations in ciliary genes actually cause uh, scoliosis. But the most important one is that mutations directly in the receptor for urotensin have been linked with scoliosis. And this is the comparison. So it's the wild type zebrafish, a normal human being, a mutant zebrafish, and a, uh, and a being with a human being with uh, scoliosis. And I wrote a review for this uh, journal, Trends in Genetics. So if you're interested, uh, you can read it. So it's, uh, it's really comparing the zebrafish work with the human genetic stuff, uh, suggesting that this pathway is quite relevant for human uh, so idiopathic scoliosis. OK, so any questions so far? So this would be the end of my first part. And I have got a little more to tell about uh, the role of celia in fertility. But I'll be happy to take questions. Too. Yes. Yes, uh, Priyadarsh. Uh, URP mutants don't have any phenotype in the kidney because it's expressed only in the CSFCNs. Yeah, Karthikeen. Uh, so, so this was raising like sort of Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I was just trying to ask, uh, you induced the cycle of poses that the different metastoliosis. Yes. Do you see also a change over there? Like okay, so uh, yes. Some yes. Some other people. Absolutely. And not just in men, in in, uh, in people, in uh, fish as well. We see more incidence of scoliosis as the fish gets older, you know. So we haven't done that work. But what I can tell you is that, for example, people with Parkinson's uh, have a much higher pr uh, probability of getting scoliosis. Because uh, if I show you the slide where, I, where these genes are expressed for, yeah, so this slide shows you the uh, epinephrine synthesizing uh, nuclei in the brain. So uh, the catecholamine synthesizing neurons are actually in the brain. And in Parkinson's disease, these neurons, the dopaminergic neurons actually die. So there is a higher prevalence of uh, scoliosis in Parkinson's patients, as well as in patients who have got ciliary disorders like uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia. So they, they, they have immotile cilia, they have recurrent respiratory inf infections because their lung cilia are not working properly and uh, scoliosis is quite common in them. But the problem is sometimes with scoliosis is because it's a musculoskeletal problem, people tend to not not to pay too much attention to it because there are other symptoms which are so overbearing, like the respiratory symptom or the cardiovascular symptom that it goes unnoticed. But there are papers suggesting that they're more prevalent in these patients. Do you suggest uh, uh, I would rather think, see, the problem with epinephrine is that it is a potent hormone, right? So regulating it as a therapeutic agent would not be something which is easily conceivable. But I think the restricted expression of the URP proteins and the URP receptor being a G protein coupled receptor is more druggable, perhaps. So looking for activators of the receptor would be more interesting. Yeah. Any further questions? Okay. So um, I will conclude with this uh, work, which which actually was published last week in Science. So if you have missed that issue, please take a look. So um, we looked at cilia in the germ cells and something which I think all of us are familiar with, which is meiosis. OK, so I know you guys have studied meiosis and mitosis. Tell me who didn't study meiosis and meiosis. Anybody here who has studied meiosis and mitosis? No, everybody, right? But tell me, how many of you knew that in meiosis, the chromosomes undergo rapid rotation? I never heard of this till I did this work. I had no clue that chromosomes, I will show you beautiful videos where the chromosomes undergo massive rotation and they do this because they want to find their partner. They're looking for their partner for homologous recombination. Okay, so let's see how that happens and how the cilia control it. So this is the paper. So if you're interested, please take a look at it. We had a very tough review process. One referee was particularly uh, difficult, but finally we managed to get it in. OK, so this is meiosis, textbook meiosis. So as you know, there are two phases, the meiotic phase one and the meiotic phase two. And much of the important action happens here where chromosomes are supposed to be pairing. They're supposed to be breaks and the crossovers and then the segregation for the reduction division, right? So the reduction, so this first phase is Again, subdivide into many parts. You have the leptotene, zygotene, packetine, diplotene, diakinesis, and synapsis and crossing over are the very important st stages for exchanging of genetic material. So um, 
Did you know that these chromosomes actually form something called the chromosomal bouquet? I don't think most of the books mentioned that. I didn't, maybe the latest ones. I didn't know about it. So the telomeres, as you know, the telomeres are the uh, ends of the chromosomes. So normally they are just distributed randomly in an interface cell. But when they start going into meiosis, what happens is that the telomeres start clustering and they form a bouquet. So the telomeres are at the ends of the chromosomes, right? So they loop. So these are the loops of the chromosomes. So the two ends have come together and form the loop here. Yeah? And the ends are meeting at this point, which is the telomeric region, okay? And they form a very tight cluster. And then the, uh, and these clusters are associated with the nuclear membrane through these proteins called the Sun cache, okay? And the Sun cache proteins then bind to the uh, microtubules, which are on, on the nuclear membrane. And the microtubules are, of course, uh, arising from the centrosome, which is the nuclear, which is the, mitotic, uh, the microtubule organizing center. So this bouquet is, uh, was discovered in the 1900s. It's, it's conserved from yeast to mammals, and it's believed to be required for a homologous uh, chromosomal recognition, pairing, synaptomial animal complex formation and recombination. So here is this video showing you in cultured zebrafish oocytes the rotation of the chromosomes. So look at it. It's amazing, right? So, and you know they're specific. So these are somatic cells. So somatic cells, the nuclei, there's no movement. These are ubonia, which are the precursors of the oocytes. So they are not going any rotation. But these are the bouquet stage uh, oocytes in meiotic division, and they have this beautiful uh, chromosomal rotations going on inside them. I had no idea that this happened. You know, it's not, at least I didn't come across any textbook which showed this. Okay, so this is the chromosomal rotations. And then what we found is that during this uh, chromosomal rotation phase, uh, a special kind of cilium is elaborated by these oocytes. So if you look at ubonia, which is before they enter meiotic division, you barely see any cilia. During the leptotene, zygotene stages, you start seeing some cilia being elaborated. They are very, very prominent during the zygotene stage, especially the bouquet stage, and by packetine stage, they can dissolve. Okay? So it seems that there's a specific stage during meiotic division one when germ cells, especially the oocytes in zebrafish, are elaborating the cilia. And we did a lot of um, labeling with different ciliary markers because here the cilia labeled with antibodies again acetylated tubulin. Now tubulin is a very ubiquitous protein and some of the reviewers said, how do you know that these are cilia? So we use uh, more specific antibodies like ARL13B, which is a specific ciliary membrane marker uh, and uh, gamma tubulin, which labels the uh, basal body. So we could show that these are cilia. Okay? And here is a very nice uh, serial block face um, scanning electron microscopy image. So I don't know whether you are familiar with this technique. Um, so, you know, scanning EM is uh, scanning the specimen for overall contour, but this involves a, fitting a microtome inside the vacuum chamber. So what it does is take sections, images, take sections, images. So it does this reiteratively till the whole depth of the tissue is uh, surveyed at EM scale and then rendered to reveal what the whole tissue looks like at the EM level. Okay? So what you can see are the cilia shown in this dark red uh, streaks, the nuclei shown in gray, and the cytoplasm shown in the different colors. Okay, So that's the uh, SBF SEM. And this is the cartoon of um, what we have uh, shown by EM. So you have a cilium, which is uh, uh, arising from the centrosome, and the centrosome is linked with the telomeres through the microtubules in these uh, uh, meiotic oocytes. So um, are these cilia motile or are they immotile? So we looked at, firstly, the transmission EM uh, data of these cilia, and they resembled immotile cilia because they don't have dynein arms. Normally, in the motile cilia, you'll have dynein arms sticking out of these microtubules, but there are no dynein arms. And secondly, we looked at some of the motile cilia genes, such as FOXJ1 and FOXJ1A and 1B, and they seem not to be expressed in the oocytes. Uh, you can see they're expressed in the somatic cells, but they're not in the oocytes themselves, so suggesting that these cilia are possibly not motile. And then we also looked at videos. So um, there's a video showing you that the cilia are, the chromosomes are rotating in some of them, but the cilia are passively moving. There's no active beating of the cilia. So this suggests that these are possibly immotile primary cilia. And you can see the beautiful movement of the chromosomes here. Okay, so we then, of course, want to know what, ha what, what happens when you remove the cilia. 
So we looked at different mutations. Now, remember I told you that if you remove cilia from the zebra fish, they develop curved body axis in the embryo, and they're not going to survive into adults and give you the germline to examine. So we had to compromise, and we had to look at some uh, viable ciliary mutants, which, are, which were not really the strongest cilia mutants, but nevertheless, we thought that they would give us a weak phenotype to tell us what's going on. So we first looked at GIF7, and you can see that about 50% of the oocytes had very short cilia. Okay? And then you also looked at CEP290. So this is another uh, gene that is required for cilia genesis. And this had a more stronger phenotype. So about 22% has shorter cilia, and most of them had no cilia. And this is the quantification of the cilia lens or the presence in the different mutant combinations. So also we made double mutant, and we found that the uh, CEP290 homozygous and GIF7 GIF heterozygous had a very strong effect, and which was even more stronger when you made the complete double mutants. Okay, so what happens when the cilia are lost? What we found is that when the cilia are lost, this tight telomere cluster that is required for uh, synapsis does not form. So in the wild type, if you look at the telomere clustering, so the clustering is studied by a technique called telofish, because you know the telomere has got repeated DNA, and you can use fluorescent in situ hybridization to highlight the telomeres. And in the wild type, you can see this tight cluster at one pole of the oocyte, and in some of them, you see an, a slightly expanded telomere, which are possibly not yet clustered yet. You never see a dispersed category in the wild term. Whereas if you look at the CEP290 mutants, you can see that the tight category is less, whereas you get more and more oocytes where the telomeres are more expanded, as if they're not able to form this tight cluster. And this is a diagrammatic representation showing you that they seem to be dispersed around the equator and a quantification of this phenotype. Okay? So, this suggests that with the ciliary anchor, you're able to get a very tight cluster of the telomeres at one pole of the oocyte, whereas without the ciliary anchor, the telomeres seem to be more dispersed uh, in the oocyte. And we also looked what is the consequence on synaptonemal complex formation. So we looked at it with the synaptonemal complex protein 3 immunofluorescence analysis. So ignore the new. So this staining is in the nucleolus. So don't uh, consider this as an artifact of the staining. But typically, the synaptonemal complex proteins start getting loaded on the chromosomes in the subtelomeric region. So the telomere cluster is about here, and you can see the proteins getting concentrated on the chromosomes. So these are the proteins which are required for strong pairing between the chromosomes before they start undergo the homologous recombination, and they spread along the length of the. Uh, looped chromosomes. Whereas in the mutants, you can see that either they are not there or pretty badly dispersed, suggesting that there's a problem in loading of these chromosomal proteins for recombination in the absence of a proper bouquet formation. Okay? And it's even more exacerbated in the double mutants for uh, CEP290 and uh, GIF7. And we also tested out what happens if you actually remove the cilium completely using laser. Uh, just to uh, phenocopy the mutants, and it's a very beautiful experiment with laser ablation. So you can, what you can take a look at is chrome centrosomes in focus are centrosomes which have not been ablated, whereas here we just perform an ablation, and you can see as soon as you ablate it, the centrosome moves out of focus, suggesting that the cilium is really required for anchoring, keeping the centrosome anchored in one place so that the microtubules are able to form this tight cluster of the of the telomeres. Okay? I can show you this video once again in case you missed it. So here is the thing that gets ablated. As soon as it gets ablated, you can see that the centrosome will disappear. It goes out of focus, suggesting it gets dislocated. And then again, it reappears back after some time. Whereas the ones which are not ablated, they remain in the plane of focus throughout the imaging of the uh, sample. Okay. okay, so then what is the consequence on fertility? So wild type fish, these are the ovaries of wild type fish. They look beautiful, nice ogonia, oocytes, all translucent. Whereas this is a CEP290 mutant. Don't be surprised by seeing the curved body. They should have curved body because they're cilia mutants, right? If you look at, if you consider the preceding section of this talk, and uh, they have these degenerating uh, ovaries. If you uh, set up spontaneous crosses, for example, if you take a female who is homozygous mutant for CEP290 and cross it with a, a homozygous mutant male, they barely produced any offspring. Uh, they all, the females also did not mate with uh, wild-type males and produce much embryos. 
So we tried a different technique that you can do in zebrafish, which is squeezing for in vitro fertilization. So you can anesthetize the fish and you can gently squeeze the belly to expel the uh, oocytes and the sperm and perform in vitro fertilization. And again, we found that the, the mutant females performed quite badly compared to the wild type females, even in in vitro fertilization. So this suggests that in the absence of cilia, there is a problem with meiosis and that impacts um, uh, the fertility and the ultimate uh, development of the germ cells. So is this just a zebrafish oocyte specific uh, thing that we discovered? Surprisingly, it's not, uh, not the case. So we found that in zebrafish spermatogenesis, um, also we find cilia. Now the problem with spermatogenesis is that the sperms have got a beautiful long cilium. So you might get mixed up with where is the cilium? Is it, are we looking at the flagella or are we looking at the at, at this uh, zygotine cilium? So what we did is we used uh, proteins, for example, SYCP3 or telofish to uh, point us to directly to the cells which are actually in meiosis. So these are spermatogonia undergoing meiosis and they are not spermatids. So the flagella starts forming in spermatid stages, right? So we were quite sure now that we are looking at the right population of cells and you can see the zygotin cilia even in this um, uh, situation. You also did electron microscopy and you can see that you can see the cilium growing out of the basal body. This is, the, you know, the cent there are two centrals. So one central hangs around beside the central that forms the basal body. So we see, see both structures. And we also looked at a mouse ogenesis. So these are E14.5 uh, mouse embryos. Uh, so the oogenesis in mammals, you know, starts very early. So the female mammals start developing their eggs even when they are fetus. And that's the case for mouse. And we dissected open uh, mothers and took out E14.5 embryos and stained their ovaries. So you can see cilia present in um, the oogonia and oocytes. So this is again stained in BASA. So BASA is a RNA binding protein specifically present in the germline. So it's a very good marker for the germline and SYCP3, which is the protein that labels the homologous pairing chromosomes. And I, I don't have a time to show you the data with the male mice, but it's, it's, it's very similar. So in conclusion, then what I've told you is that uh, cilia are differentiated by germ cells in the zygotic stage. The cilia seem to be anchoring the centrosome for proper chromosomal bouquet formation. Uh, and it, the bouquet is required for synapses and recombination. Uh, the loss of cilia causes uh, defective maturation of germ cells and infertility. And uh, it, this loss of cilia or defective cilia could explain infertility issues faced by ciliopathy patients. Okay? So the most common problem with ciliopathy patients, of course, the males are infertile, not surprisingly because their uh, sperm are unable to swim because they don't make a good flagellum. But, um, and there's another issue as well. So uh, the females have got motile cilia in the oviducts. So all, all women have motile cilia in the oviducts and the, 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 the cilia required to bring the o released ovum into the uterus for implantation. In the males, we have a similar process as well, which was again not known to me, but we recently published a paper. So the male testis has got motile cilia in a structure called the uh, efferent ducts. I was not aware of it again. So the efferent ducts have got motile cilia, which are churning away, mixing your uh, seminal fluid and making sure it's always nice and fresh. And it also helps to propel the sperm into the epididymis for ejaculation. OK, so keep that in mind. It's not to the sperm tails. We have got cilia in the testes and other places as well. So mostly the fertility issues in ciliopathy patients were, were explained by the lack of those kinds of cilia. But now it seems that in the oogenesis or gonadogenesis process itself or um, germ cell genesis itself, there are, there's a role of the special cilia called the zygotin cilium. Um, uh, so this must be taken into account. And I just end with this exciting uh, com comment by one of the reviewers saying that this is really exciting science and it uh, benefits to be in the in uh, textbook material. So uh, this is Singapore. I know some of you know this very well. Karthiki, of course, had a home there. And I know uh, some said they had come and seen this place. Something do you remember this or have forgotten? Is, is it there? No, he's there. Okay. And um, uh, yeah, so this is Singapore. And uh, the spine work was done by uh, my very talented uh, technician, Yan Ling Chong, uh, Hao Lu, a uh, uh, postdoc, and Aidana Shabirova, my grad student, contributed to the Rice Fiber work. And Tao Chu did the work with the uh, germ cell cilia. And I collaborated with uh, Cheng Tian Zhao from the Ocean University. 
Julian Gorgi in Singapore helped us with the micro CT scans in the Bioimaging Consortium. And Yannick was my collaborator at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem for the, for the uh, OSITE work. So this work is founded by uh, NMRC, the National Research Foundation, and core funds from the Institute of Molecular and Cell Biology. So I'll be happy to take questions, but before I, I don't know whether I have got this other slide. Okay, yeah, so there is this other slide. So I told, I was told that this is, we are celebrating the 75th year of Indian independence, right? So I thought that we talk about independence, we talk about freedom, we have been talking about freedom uh, before 1940s from the British, and then after we got the freedom, we started complaining about the Indian government. We complain about our wives, we complain about our husbands, we complain about our health, we complain about everything. We want to be free from many, many things, right? We complain about our bosses, which I think is very common here. Bosses complain about their students. We want to be free. So here is Jiddu Krishnamurti. I don't know whether you know of Jiddu Krishnamurti, but just listen to what he has to say about what freedom really means, okay? Enjoy it. Do you know of Jiddu Krishnamurti, any of you? No, he was a 20th century Indian philosopher. Okay, so um, just listen to what he has to say. That's a stupid question. Why does it happen? What's the nature of freedom? Yeah. This is a short video. I won't take.
Okay, so I end with that. And I think this video is very interesting because it tells you that, um, you know, it questions the experience, right? So you say, I want to be free. The question is, who is this I who wants to be free? So I think we have to all introspect and find out who is the I who wants to be free. So I leave you on that, okay? So any questions? Please, yeah. Thank you. 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 Yes. Okay. Before that, we want to be linked to each other. Yes. I'm not, I'm not talking about any political freedom or. But yes. Shadi means that we are celebrating here. Yes. Our nationality, our. Yes. Free from our colonial. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. But here we also think of global politics. I think lots of our political questions also be there. Yes. Or I'm not talking about this political freedom. Yes. But I think I really like the philosophy of the freedom. Yes. Now, come Thank <laughs> But there's a very nice video of his where he talks about dying before death. Okay, yes, so I would, yeah, please, please, if you're interested, uh, take a look at it. Yeah. yeah. My question is about the background of science. Very interesting things. Yes. Uh, ciliary, beautiful ciliary genes. Yes. Also, I think 